I think what, what you guys are doing is absolutely spectacular. I've looked at your website. I think that the host of people that you've had, myself excluded that is, are really fantastic uh, thought leaders in the field. And um, it'll pay off for you because you're gonna be a heck of a lot smarter, certainly than I was when I was a medical student entering uh, neurosurgery. All the knowledge that you all garner from doing this uh, is worth its weight in gold. So again, uh, with that, I want to thank you for the invitation and, and discuss cerebral aneurysms, a topic I absolutely love talking about. Uh, just some relevant disclosures. These are companies that do all make devices uh, for the treatment of aneurysms, particularly endovascularly. So I am a consultant for these three. And so a very important principle, just stepping back, when you look at cerebrovascular disease, anytime you see a problem, whether it's an aneurysm, an AVM, a cavernous malformation, is you take a step back and you say, what is the natural history of this problem, which is going to predicate whether or not you watch the problem or whether you treat it, and then what are the treatment options if you decide to treat it? There are always options, uh, surgical options, endovascular options not for aneurysms, but potentially for other cerebrovascular pathology, radiation is also an option. And it's important to always think about them in this phase. Do I need to treat it or not? Then that's predicated on the natural history. And then what are my options if I decide to treat it? And that's gonna to totally guide this talk today. So uh, to stratify the discussion today, uh, we're gonna to talk about the different types of aneurysms. We'll really be focusing on saccular aneurysms. We'll talk about risk factors for their formation briefly. We'll spend a decent amount of time talking about anatomy that I hope will be fruitful for people at a variety of levels, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. And then, of course, the key factors, natural history, and then treatment options. So I like to think of aneurysms as stratified into four types. You have your saccular aneurysms. These are your typical aneurysms that occur at hemodynamic stress points, and these are the ones that are going to be the focus of this discussion for the remainder. But I do want to allude to dissecting pseudoaneurysms, which in extreme form are blisters. I'll have a one slide on that. Fusiform aneurysms, which are illustrated, is illustrated in the middle pane here. I don't know if you see my arrow, but this is a fusiform vertebral aneurysm, unfortunately, with the anterior spinal coming right out of it. And then finally, there are mycotic or infectious aneurysms that can occur. And again, the latter three are not really going to be the focus of this discussion. But just as uh, to review and, and explain each one. So a saccular aneurysm, again, typically occurs at a hemodynamic stress point. It's a turn, and usually there's a branch vessel that's associated with that turn, right? So uh, typical uh, examples include the ACOM at the bottom left, the PCOM, uh, ophthalmic aneurysms. These are side, this, this is an example, a true example of a sidewall aneurysm. And then at the far bottom right, a basilar apex aneurysm, and that's a, a true bifurcation aneurysm that occurs at a at a bifurcation of a main vessel. Uh, and, and again, these are going to be the focus of our discussion. We're going to evaluate each of these by location in general, in general and in detail. But it's important to emphasize that these are hemodynamic phenomena. They occur at hemodynamic stress points. Typically, it turns, and there's usually a branch associated with them. Now, in contrast to that, a dissecting pseudoaneurysm is really a tear in the wall of an artery. There's not necessarily an associated branch vessel. Uh, and what can happen is the, the, the tear in the wall can enlarge and become a pseudoaneurysm. And you can also have some narrowing. So what you can see here in the figure uh, towards the top is there's a fusiform or dissecting aneurysm of the vertebral artery distant so that there's a stenosis. Now to the right of that picture, you can see that I've treated the aneurysm using a flow diverting stent that has remodeled the artery that's treated the stenosis, but also uh, led to occlusion of the pseudoaneurysm. Now, the extreme form, in my opinion, of a dissecting pseudoaneurysm or tear in the wall of an artery is a frank hole in the artery, or what we can refer to as a blister. A blister is typically diagnosed in the setting of a hemorrhage, and it's a often just appears as a tiny little bump in the artery. That red arrow is showing the blister. These are also treated with these flow diverting stents uh, to basically treat them. And again, another final type of, of aneurysm that won't be the focus of this discussion are mycotic aneurysms. These are infectious aneurysms that occur, they can occur anywhere, but also but can occur in the cerebral vasculature. So what happens is typically an infected embolus lodges in the blood vessel. Uh, this infected embolus all, often occurs typically in the setting of endocarditis or septicemia. And then as the infection 
basically takes root in the blood vessel, the blood vessel can blow out and become an aneurysm and rupture. Uh, less commonly in the setting of meningitis or perhaps uh, with the arteries adjacent to sphenoid sinus, the proximal carotid artery, you can have direct contiguous spread of an infection uh, that can cause uh, a mycotic pseudoaneurysm, but that's far less typical. And again, the vessel just blows out. So this is just an example of a patient with a parietal hemorrhage and endocarditis. Um, it's very hard to see on the large angiogram, the zoomed out angiogram, but there's a distal M4 parietal mycotic aneurysm. You can see the zoomed up view when I have a microcatheter near it and we deposit some uh, liquid and bolizate some onyx into it. And then you can see the onyx occludes the vessel. And then in the post-op, that brightness is basically the onyx that's occluding the aneurysm. So again, switching gears and focusing on saccular aneurysms. So this is an interesting study out of the New England Journal that looked at a bunch of MRIs and just noted the prevalence of a variety of incidental findings on 2,000 MRI scans. And, and it's actually interesting to see uh, beyond the scope of aneurysms what they found. Uh, but what you could see is that 1.8% of patients had cerebral aneurysms truly incidentally. And this is an interesting prevalence study from the New England Journal. But I think perhaps uh, the most useful study was this uh, meta-analysis uh, published in Lancet Neurology about a decade ago that basically just took all these studies together to help really define the prevalence of cerebral aneurysms in a variety of populations. So you can see this was an, a meta-analysis of 68 studies with 83 populations uh, with a whole bunch of aneurysms in patients. And the overall prevalence from this study was 3%. So you know that's what I generally cite in my clinic to patients when I talk about the prevalence of aneurysms. Now you can see that the vast majority of aneurysms, two thirds were less than five millimeters in size. This is very small. 27% were five to nine millimeters or shall we say average size and only 7% were large. That is a centimeter or larger, 10 millimeters or larger. Interestingly, they found that there was no impact on the country of origin of the study on the general prevalence. So this is nice because if you read say a study from another country, um, this meta-analysis suggests that that can have uh, reasonable validity to our country, at least in terms of prevalence data. They found that there was a statistically, statistically significant increase in prevalence of aneurysms among patients with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, ADPKD. If there was a family history of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, or the pre, you could see I noted the prevalence ratios in the slide. And for female sex, uh, particularly if the patients are older than 50, if they looked at patients older than 50. Interestingly, apropos of the prior study that was fairly authoritative, they found that if you only looked at studies that used MRI without MRA, MR angiography or CT angiography, they perhaps cited a lower prevalence of cerebral aneurysms, presumably because of the lower sensitivity of the study modality in detecting the aneurysm. So this emphasized the importance of using MRA or CTA as your initial screening modality. But again, the take home point from this meta-analysis in this slide is that in general, the overall prevalence of, of cerebral aneurysms is 3%. So saccular aneurysms, what are some risk factors for their formation? So again, these are aneurysms that occur at stress points. This is a basilar apex aneurysm you can see here, a, a bifurcation aneurysm. And when we look in the literature fairly consistently, we, there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So the non-modifiable risk factors of aneurysm formation are increasing age. So young patients generally don't get aneurysms uh, unless they have traumatic aneurysms, but rarely in familial cases, certainly they can have aneurysms. Uh, female sex, aortic coarctation is actually also a risk factor. Then there are, there are frank other genetic risk factors. So family histories that we've already alluded to, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. The, the, the following are a little bit less uh, formal, but generally accepted, and multiple endocrine neoplasia, MEN type 1, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, HHT, Ehlers-Danlos type 4, Marfan syndrome, and neurofibromatosis type 1 are potential risk factors for cerebral aneurysms independently. Importantly, the modifiable risk factors, the things that I mentioned in my patients in clinic, generally correlate to poor cardiovascular health. So smoking, hypertension, poor cardiovascular health generally equates, in fact, to a risk factor of cerebral aneurysm formation, which is important to emphasize. Aneurysms are typically found incidentally, perhaps in the setting of innocuous neurological symptoms like dizziness or unrelated headaches, uh, typically not the worst headache of your life. Um, alternatively, they can be found if they rupture in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage, unfortunately. 
And perhaps most rarely in terms of presentation, but certainly something we see is symptoms due to mass effect. Again, aneurysms are typically small, they're typically less than a centimeter, so they typically do not exert mass effect symptoms, but rarely larger ophthalmic artery aneurysms can cause vision loss, or you can have a third nerve palsy from a posterior communicating artery aneurysm or a superior cerebellar artery aneurysm. Again, giant aneurysms anywhere can cause other symptoms, but these are the typical mass effect symptoms that you can have. And I can, if I had a nickel for every time someone with a third nerve palsy was said to have a basilar tip aneurysm, I'd probably have uh, at least 50 cents. It's important. If someone has a third nerve palsy, they do not have a basilar tip aneurysm. They have an SCA aneurysm. That's, that's an important sort of clinical pearl. And that's actually illustrated here uh, to the right here. This is a superior cerebellar artery aneurysm. In a patient with a third nerve palsy, you can see actually the superior cerebellar artery emanates from the aneurysm. So familial aneurysms, I mentioned that a family history is a risk factor for aneurysm formation. There are a couple interesting studies I think are important to highlight. So this study out of the Lancet looked at families with two or more affected family members. And this went out to even include cousins. Uh, they uh, accrued in 91 families, a small number of them had autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And among, among familial intracranial aneurysms, they found a prevalence of 9%. That's a lot higher than the 3% that we saw earlier. So certainly a family history is clearly a risk factor. Um, and the most common relation among patients with aneurysms was a sibling. They looked at sibling, parent, cousin, and so forth. Um, and then th this is a paper from the Familial Intracranial Aneurysm Study published over a decade ago that also looked at families with two or more affected family members. Uh, they had Now, they looked at first-degree relatives, so a little bit of a closer relationship. They looked at 303 first-degree relatives who underwent MRA and found that at least 19% 19, 19 had at least one aneurysm, uh, a slightly higher prevalence with females, 24% versus 12%. And they found, in fact, that female sex, in addition to smoking and hypertension, were independent risk factors for the presence of cerebral aneurysms. Interestingly, these were very small, two thirds were two to three millimeters, almost a third was four to six millimeters, and a tiny number were seven millimeters or larger. Okay, so we've looked at uh, different types of aneurysms. We looked at risk factors for aneurysm formation. I'm now gonna review some angiographic anatomy at a variety of levels. So starting very simply, uh, these are angiographic views of the anterior circulation. This is an internal carotid artery injection. Uh, the left, to our left, is an ape, what we call an AP view. This is sort of a, not actually a coronal view. This is a little bit of a coronal plus axial view. And to the right, we have uh, a lateral view of the internal injection. And you can see I've lineated what is the internal carotid, the MCA and the ACA. You can see the bifurcation on the AP view a lot better than the lateral view, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, any questions? Oh, I think uh, we'll just move on. Uh, so here's a view of the poster circulation. This is a vertebral injection from the right vertebral artery. You can see I've labeled the pica, um, actually the anterior spinal artery in the middle, uh, the basilar artery, and then the relevant branches of the basilar artery, the AICA, the SCA, and the PCA as well, both in a, this is a more transfacial view. So this is a lot more like a coronal view on the left and to the right is a lateral view. Again, you can see the vertebral, the pica branch, the ASA, the anterior spinal artery, the basilar, the AICA, the SCA, and the PCA. So, getting into a little bit more of the weeds of the anatomy for the ICA. So here I've lineated the ICA segments according to the Boutillier classification. This is a 1997 paper that I think has significant relevance to neurosurgeons. I think it's, the, it's probably the best and most reproducible anatomic description. So from uh, proximal to distal, you can see I've labeled a Petrus segment. And I always say I sort of talk about this up across up. Uh, that defines what is both the petra segment and then the cavernous segment has a, initially a superior course, an anterior course, and then a superior course as well, akin to the petra segment. So those are the two truly extradural segments that are intracranial of the carotid artery. So if you have an aneurysm of those segments, it generally cannot cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. It can cause problems due to mass effect, but these are not locations where you can have a bleed from. Now, distal to the cavernous segment is the Easy to understand, but not frequently or appropriately frequently described clinoidal segment that lies between the two dural rings. Small aneurysms in this location are still functionally extradural, meaning they can't cause intracranial hemorrhage. You then have the ophthalmic segment that goes from the ophthalmic artery 
to the posterior communicating artery. It's from this that you can have intradural aneurysms that can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage, although with the exception of the blister variant aneurysms, these tend to be the lowest risk aneurysms in the head. You then have the communicating segment that goes from the PCOM up to the ICA terminus, and it starts at the PCOM. You can see this, I use this uh, angiogram because there's a very large PCOM and PCA that are lineated. So I want to talk a little bit about what is the paraclinoid region, the paraclinoid region, in the region of the anterior process. This includes both the clinoidal segment and the ophthalmic segment. Uh, I think it's a real misnomer to call the ophthalmic segment supraclinoid, which some people do because it's actually beneath the clinoid process, uh, surgically speaking. So the paraclinoid region refers to the clinoidal and the ophthalmic segment. And uh, so the clinoidal segment begins at the proximal dural ring, which is an incomplete ring that encircles the carotid artery. It starts from the inferior aspect of the clinoid process. Uh, and then it basically goes from the lateral ICA to the medial aspect of the third nerve and serves really as the roof of the cavernous sinus. There's typically no branches from the clinoidal segment, although you can have aneurysms that arise from an immediately projecting aneurysm that can mimic what I will describe as a hypophyseal aneurysm and an anterolateral or superiorly projecting variant that can sort of look like an ophthalmic artery aneurysm. The clinoidal segment ends at the distal dural ring, which is a complete dural encircling of the carotid artery. And this is a nice picture, I think, that I stole from an old Barrow, uh, Barrow Focus article on their website that really nicely shows in a cadaver the proximal and distal dural rings and the basically the clinoidal segment. Some people call this the carotid cave, although the carotid cave is actually a medial fold of, of dura uh, adjacent to the medial aspect of the carotid artery. Uh, it's actually not the carotid cave, it's the clinoidal segment. And I have a couple angiograms in the top right that's a medial clinoidal aneurysm. Some people may call that a distal cavernous aneurysm. I would call that a medial clinoidal aneurysm. And then at the bottom right, this is the same patient with a large anterolateral clinoidal aneurysm. You can see on the lateral, this is starting down in the clinoidal segment. It probably has intradural extension at this size. Uh, so this is reasonable to treat, but there are a lot of people treating four or five millimeter clinoidal aneurysms that probably don't need to be treated extradural. So moving on to the ophthalmic segment, the ophthalmic segment starts at the complete dural ring and ends at the posterior communicating artery or typical PCOM takeoff. Um, ophthalmic segment aneurysms are generally uh, underestimated because they have lower bleed rates. They are more common in females. You can see that um, there, this is just a nice excerpt from an old uh, Dr. Day paper, uh, an excellent paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery from 1990 on ophthalmic aneurysms. I think it's a really useful paper on the anatomy of these. But it's a nice, this is a nice uh, cadaver picture of, uh, of the ophthalmic artery and then the superior hypophyseal arteries going medially towards the pituitary. Uh, and these are some, some angiograms of my own. So in, in the bottom here, this is an ophthalmic artery aneurysm that projects superiorly. And to the right, this is the same patient, an AP in a lateral view of an irregular medially projecting superior hypophyseal aneurysm. This is one of the few I ever saw that ruptured. These are Superior so hypophyseal aneurysms are probably the lowest risk aneurysms uh, in the head for rupture that are actually intradural. And they are also probably overtreated. So this is just a, a surgical view when you come subfrontally and you can see I've labeled the internal carotid artery, the optic nerve and the clinoid process. And you can see how the carotid artery is sort of infraclinoid, the ophthalmic segment is infraclinoid. It's beneath the clinoid, it is not supraclinoid. Uh, and this is, if you drill the way the clinoid, you'll see more of the ophthalmic segment. And so uh, here the arrow is on a superior hypophyseal aneurysm that burrows medially. You can see you don't have a very good view of these surgically. And these are pretty much nowadays almost ubiquitously treated through endovascular means, which we'll talk about later. Um, and so that's immediately projecting superior hypophyseal aneurysm. You can see the ophthalmic segment lying beneath the clinoid process and adjacent to the uh, second nerve. A uh, common question you'll get uh, early on is figuring out what side you are. And it's always that relationship of the carotid artery sort of lateral and inferior to the optic nerve. So you know that this, uh, in this case, you're coming from the right side. Uh, here's just a, a, a true superior projecting ophthalmic artery aneurysm that's being clipped. And so moving on to the communicating segment. So there are really two main aneurysms that arise from the communicating segment. They occur at, at branch points. They occur at the PCOM and the anterocroidal artery, right? So uh, the communicating segment is actually supraclinoid. 
Uh, and so the, the terms para and supraclinoid that you'll hear thrown around a lot, the whole idea was back when we had uh, just angiograms and didn't have good CTAs and so forth, if the surgeon had to drill the clinoid process to expose the aneurysm, typically an ophthalmic segment aneurysm, rarely a PCOM aneurysm, those are considered paraclinoid aneurysms. If the aneurysm was truly free from the clinoid process, uh, meaning a, most PCOMs and certainly uh, the vast majority, if not all of anterocoidal aneurysms, basically all of them, uh, you don't need to drill the clinoid. Those are supraclinoid aneurysms, meaning pretty much communicating segment aneurysms are truly supraclinoid. Uh, now, when we talk about the PCOM, uh, you, very important, the anterothalamic perforator should be preserved. Um, these come off the superior medial aspect of the PCOM, which is why you always open the membrane of liliquis beneath the PCOM. And there's really two common orientations for PCOM aneurysms, the posterior inferior orientation, and these are the ones that can cause third nerve palsy. And then the lateral orientation, these are the ones that can uh, adhere to the temporal lobe and be a problem if you retract on the temporal lobe if you're treating them surgically. So this angiogram shows a PCOM aneurysm. Uh, there. Uh, and here's some uh, anatomic depictions here uh, when you're dealing with more of the communicating segment of the ICA. Uh, this is a little bit more of a lateral exposure. In this case, the zygoma was, was dropped. And you can see that there's two triangles, the one triangle between the ICA and the optic nerve, that's the carotid optic triangle. And then more laterally, there's the carotid ocular motor triangle between the carotid artery and the third nerve. And these are triangles you can use to get back towards the basilar apex if you do find yourself uh, clipping one of these uh, in 2022. Uh, and here's, a, uh, here's just another depiction. You can see I've labeled the PCOM and the anterocoroidal artery coming off the communicating segment of the ICA. There's the membrane of Lilliquist, and you can see we're working in the carotid ocular motor triangle there. And here's an anterocoroidal aneurysm. Now, what's interesting was this, this aneurysm was clipped uh, 20 years prior, and I guess, some people are told after they're clipped, the patient says they were told they didn't need to follow up. Um, but unfortunately, this came back with a, with a rupture. Um, you can see that we, we coiled it in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, taking care to preserve the ostium of the anterocoidal artery. You can see it's that very fragile artery from the opposite side of where the clip is uh, that, again, we really didn't want to let any coils get near. Uh, this is a fairly typical ICA terminus aneurysm with a narrow neck. And moving on to the MCA, so important anatomy of the MCA. So uh, the MCA has four segments. Um, unfortunately, sometimes these are often uh, confounded when people are doing thrombectomies, but they're all perpendicular to each other and beautifully defined in, in Dr. Lawton's Seven Aneurysms book. I, I think that is a true must read for anyone going into cerebrovascular or even any neurosurgeon who really wants to appreciate great anatomy, beautiful pictures. Um, I've stolen a couple of, of pictures from that textbook, um, citing him, Dr. Lawton. Um, this is my angiogram, though, and, and I want to emphasize the four segments of the MCA. So M1, the sphenoidal segment, that's the segment that's running parallel to the sphenoid ridge, okay, coming from the ICA terminus up to the Lyman insula. The Lyman insula uh, is the anterior most point, anterior to the insula. And then the MCA makes a turn backwards, M2, and runs along the insula, the insular segment. Um, this all the way back, if it's going along the insula, it's still M2. M3 comes up from the insula to the surface of the sylvian fissure. This is the opercular segment, okay? Uh, and then M4 is cortical. And these, these designations are really neurosurgical, right? So when you do a craniotomy and you're looking at the surface of the brain, you're looking at M4 branches coursing up along the frontal and temporal lobes. As you split the sylvian fissure, you follow M3 branches from the superficial aspect to the depth of the sylvian fissure until you arrive at the insular segment, at the M2 that's running along the insula that you can then follow to the Lyman insula, to the M1, to the sphenoidal segment. Again, these make excellent neurosurgical sense. Um, they're actually very easy to see on an AP angiogram, the M1, the M2, the M3, and the M4. But again, I, I do find that Nowadays, as we do a lot of stroke thrombectomy, a lot of people are calling M2 uh, things M3s and M4s, but it's important if it's still along the insula, it's still an M2 uh, occlusion. And, and this is important because the M2 is a lot safer and more tethered than these free M3 opercular segments if you're working endovascularly. Uh, so this is an example actually of an MCA bifurcation aneurysm. Um, while the majority of these are still probably managed surgically in place of good capability, you can certainly treat these endovascularly. This was an MCA aneurysm that was treated by a balloon-assisted coiling by myself a few years ago. And actually, that 
that picture is a four-year follow-up angiogram. So sometimes that does have good durability as well. To, so moving on to our two important ACA aneurysms, we have our ACOM, which is to the left and in the middle, and then our pericolosal aneurysms, right? At the typically, it, this is actually a distal pericolosal aneurysm, um, but they most commonly occur at the bifurcation uh, of the ACA into pericolosal and colosal marginal branches. I will say that these pericolosal aneurysms are sneaky high risk. We don't have great natural history studies of them, but they are high risk aneurysms in general. Um, and then uh, quickly going through the poster circulation so that we have time to talk about natural history and treatment. Uh, I've lineated here a, a pike aneurysm to the left, a typical vertebral basilar junction BBJ aneurysm, an irregular SCA aneurysm on the right side. And then finally, in the far right, you have a, ba a patient with multiple aneurysms, a, a basilar tip at the top, a right SCA, and actually a right pike aneurysm as well. So these are our typical locations. This is just an important review of the anatomy. Um, I hope that makes it clear as we go through. Uh, here's just a little cartoon I made showing all of these uh, typical uh, locations all in kind of one spot here. Uh, and just something to potentially use as a reference. So now going into their natural history. And, and again, this is how we decide whether or not to treat these aneurysms. When you're deciding if anything in cerebrovascular disease, am I going to treat it or not? The first question to ask is, what is the natural history? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about two very important natural history studies. So the first is ISUIA, the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms. This study was almost 20 years old now. Um, this was a prospective evaluation of a cohort of aneurysms, but it's important to emphasize that this was a selected cohort of, uh, of aneurysms where they decided some of them were treated and excluded from the analysis and others were included. So you already have some selection bias where uh, perhaps high-risk aneurysms are treated. Now, initially there is sort of a notoriously studied prior ISUIA study, the retrospective study that was published in the England Journal in 1998, that quoted an extremely low rupture risk for cerebral aneurysms that is really no longer accepted today. Just to briefly state, they cited a 0.05% per year risk of aneurysms, uh, risk of rupture for aneurysms less than 10 millimeters, which is, which is just inaccurate. I, I put this slide up almost for historical purposes. So th this is the prospective component that was published in Lancet. Uh, they looked at aneurysms over a seven-year period, although the majority were for the last two years of the collection period uh, from over 53 centers. Uh, and again, this study did have patients that were treated. You can see more patients were treated than were observed, but 1,692 patients did not have aneurysmal repair, and they were followed over a mean follow-up of 4.1 years, uh, stratified in group one, whether there was subarachnoid hemorrhage from another aneurysm, group two, if they had subarachnoid hemorrhage from another aneurysm. And the patients were removed for follow up if they were treated or if they passed away. And so uh, this is really sort of the money slide from ISUIA. Uh, so uh, basically 51 patients, 3% ruptured. Um, you can see the mortality from rupture was 65%. Uh, and these are, and so this chart is the five year rupture rate. So a lot of people annualize rupture rates. So you have to actually divide these numbers by five. Um, so patients without a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, actually, if they had an anterocirculation MCA or ICA aneurysm, were quoted as having a, quote, 0% risk of rupture of less than 7 millimeters. This is a highly biased cohort, though, where patients with perhaps irregularities or higher risk small aneurysms were probably treated. Um, so the actual risk is not 0%, but in this study, they quote 0%. If you had a poster circulation or poster communicating artery aneurysm that was less than seven millimeters, your risk of rupture was 0.5% per year or 2.5% over five years. And everyone can sort of review or take a snapshot of this chart. You can see they went up to seven to 12 millimeters and then 13 to 24 millimeters. And if you had a giant aneurysm in the poster circulation or the PCOM, the risk of rupture was 50% over five years or annualized, that's 10%. And they found that basilar apex location uh, PCOM location were high risk factors for rupture, and obviously cavernous aneurysms, unless they're extremely large, are extra dural and thus don't have a risk of rupture. Perhaps a more applicable study, uh, although it was exclusively done in Japan, is the natural course of unruptured cerebral aneurysms in a Japanese cohort study, or UCAS study, published in the New England Journal about a decade ago. This was a study of over 5,000 patients. Um, and you can see the selection here of the patients, uh, and they included saccular aneurysms that were at least three millimeters. And they looked at a variety of risk factors associated with rupture at follow-up. They found that an irregularity or daughter sac was a significant risk factor that always intuitively guides our treatment. They found that size was a risk factor. They found that ACOM 
location was a significant risk factor for rupture, as was PCOM location as well. Uh, on the verge of lower risk were ICA non-PCOM aneurysms. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. They found, however, that Another aneurysm with subarachnoid hemorrhage, smoking, family history, and multiple aneurysms were not significant risk factors, although these have borne out in other studies to be significant risk factors for hemorrhage. So the overall annual rupture rate was about 1% in this study. And that's just a, a crude rough estimate that people generally quote for aneurysms. If they say, what's the risk factor, risk of aneurysm rupture per year, it's about 1% per year, although admittedly it's a lot lower for small uh, ICA aneurysms. Uh, and so the morbidity and mortality in this study from rupture was 29 and 35 percent respectively. And this is a really useful table that I've excerpted below. Um, you can see that ACOM aneurysms that were only three or four millimeters had almost a 1 percent risk of rupture per year. And that was really the highest risk of rupture per year. But what's really also interesting is if you look at both the three to four and five to six millimeter cohort, the ACOM location, the PCOM location, and this undesignated other cohort um, were probably the highest risk locations. And what's interesting is this other cohort was largely comprised and uh, those distal ACA aneurysms that I allude to are actually sneaky high risk. They generally don't get very large. They don't grow to seven to nine or 10 millimeters because they generally rupture before they get to that point. So there is some clandestine evidence from this study or suggestion from this study, I should say, that, that pericolosal aneurysms, in addition to ACOM and PCOM aneurysms, are higher risk aneurysm locations. And you can see the risk of rupture bearing out. I'm not going to say every single percent. You can look at how malignant large PCOM and ACOM aneurysms are, uh, in addition to the steep rise in risk of rupture for Basler TIP or Basler SCA aneurysms as well. Um, and this was just a little, a, a, a far less significant study of, of my own that, that, that I did when I was a resident that, that stratified aneurysms locations by presentation and just even parsed out location and risk of rupture even more. Uh, and so the lowest risk we found was superior hypophyseal aneurysms. And you can see superior hypophyseal is at the top and was really the lowest risk location. Uh, lower risk locations included ICA bifurcation, ophthalmic aneurysms, and then sort of getting up there were the PCOM, the ACOM, and again here, the pericolosal uh, aneurysms as well. Uh, so this is just, again, a detailed review of, of aneurysm location and risk of rupture as it relates to that. So to answer our question, to treat or not to treat, what is the natural history, right? So ruptured aneurysms have an extremely high risk of re-rupture. So we treat them across the board. Symptomatic aneurysms, those that are large enough or regular enough to cause third nerve palsies or vision loss are treated across the board. They're thought to have a very bad natural history. But other factors, so the patient is very elderly, the relevance of, of a 1% or less risk of rupture per year is, is becomes a lot more, a lot less significant rather than someone who is perhaps very young with perhaps a more innocuous looking aneurysm. So I do factor in age when I decide whether to treat an unruptured aneurysm or not. Uh, size is also a factor. Uh, I generally treat most aneurysms more than seven millimeters. They're less than five millimeters. I look for other factors that would push me to treat, such as an irregularity or something, but otherwise I usually use that as a cutoff towards conservative management. As I've mentioned in detail, location is very relevant. So superior apophyseal aneurysms and ophthalmic artery aneurysms, uh, unfortunately, they are definitely overtreated, I think, in, in this day and age because people like to put flow diverters across them, but they generally tend to be fairly low risk aneurysms for a lot of patients. So unless they're irregular and so forth, they can often be observed. On the other hand, even small ACOM and precolosal aneurysms tend to be high risk, and we should probably have a lower threshold to treat these aneurysms. And certainly if the aneurysm harbors an irregularity, that should be treated. So this is an example of an ICA terminus aneurysm in a patient that had been lost to follow-up that had been treated for contralateral aneurysms that is highly irregular and bilobed. Obviously it was treated. Um, an interesting point, if you decide not to treat an aneurysm, the approach is to just follow it with serial imaging and see if it enlarges. And enlargement is considered a change of about one millimeter. And so what is the significance of enlargement? Well, there's actually an interesting paper that just came out in JAMA Neurology that, that helps define that. So this was a, an individual patient data analysis from 15 international cohorts that looked at 312 patients with at least a day of follow-up that had frank growth of their aneurysm. That was defined as a millimeter or more. And these aneurysms in general had a 7.6% annual rupture rate. So obviously aneurysms that, uh, that change should be treated is what this study suggests. And predictors of rupture included 
uh, size of uh, seven millimeters or greater, regular shape, and these locations that we've already discussed. So we've gone through uh, all of the detail on the background. Now it's time for the fun. Uh, if an aneurysm is deemed appropriate for treatment, that is a ruptured aneurysm, a symptomatic aneurysm, or a large and or regular aneurysm, we're going to talk a little bit about treatment. Uh, and so there are generally two treatment options, the famous clip versus coil debate, right? So there's microsurgery, which is done under a microscope, which is clipping, which is open brain surgery, is generally considered more durable than what I will call intrasacular, not all endovascular approaches. I would say most honest hybrid neurosurgeons will tell you that microsurgery and flow diversion probably have comparable durability. So that old adage that microsurgery is more durable uh, certainly holds weight for intrasacular therapy, but not necessarily for flow diversion therapy, which we'll talk about. Microsurgery could be ideal if there's concern that there's an incorporated branch in the aneurysm. This can be a problem with a lot of MCA or even uh, rarely the anatomy of the ACOM can be a problem as well. Um, and so these are things that generally push us towards thinking about microsurgery. Um, very rarely, but uh, very complex aneurysms, blood, MCAs, or weird picas can need uh, complex bypass procedures that can be done, which really speaks to the importance of maintaining uh, complex fellowship training and open neurosurgery. Um, now, uh, endovascular therapy uh, has the, quote, advantage of having no craniotomy. Um, it's not necessarily less invasive because the consequences can be just as bad as microsurgery, um, but it does allow for potentially faster recovery and certainly, I think any honest hybrid neurosurgeon will tell you that if you can coil a ruptured aneurysm, that is the way to go. It is not fun to operate in a subarachnoid hemorrhage brain, no matter how seasoned you are. Um, and so this is just a picture of, my, of uh, microsurgical clips and, and a PCOM being coiled. Um, so I do have to allude to two very important studies. That is the ISAT and the BRAT study. These are uh, randomized studies that evaluated treatment of ruptured, not unruptured aneurysm. So ISAT, International Subarachnoid Trial, was a multi-center uh, European prospective uh, trial uh, that looked at, over the time period, 22% of ruptured aneurysms that were deemed amenable to surgery or endovascular therapy. The majority of these were in good clinical grade in the anterior circulation because again, they were something that they thought was safe for microsurgery. And the primary outcome was death or dependence at one year. And there were statistically significantly better outcomes with uh, endovascular therapy. Uh, this was a post hoc analysis that showed better cognitive outcomes as well with endovascular therapy. And then there was a long term study published a few years ago in The Lancet that looked at 10 year outcomes. And still, although survival and independence were not statistically significant, if you looked at survival or independence in 10 years, if you sort of put the two together, there was still a statistically significant benefit for endovascular therapy. Um, there were more uh, rebleeds in the endovascular group, um, although this difference. Uh, was perhaps not clinically significant as we still had better death or uh, be better uh, lower rates rather of death or dependence in the uh, endovascular cohort. The Barrow ruptured aneurysm trial was a trial performed at the Barrow Neurological Institute uh, over a decade ago. Uh, it was an intention treat analysis of very well matched cohort. So this was a different thing than ISAT where they took aneurysm and they said, oh, these can be coil or clip. This was an, the BRAT study was an intention treat analysis where everyone who hit the door, even angio-negative subarachnoid hemorrhages were randomized to either endovascular or microsurgical uh, therapy. Uh, now, this was a while ago, they used matrix coils that are no longer really used. Um, but again, this was a true intention to treat analysis. And what they found in their one-year study was a statistically significant lower rate of death or dependence in the endovascular therapy group. Um, now, when they looked at a uh, 10-year follow-up, this statistically significant difference did not bear out, although this was a subgroup of saccular aneurysms. I'm not sure everyone involved in the study really adjudicated uh, this, this subgroup of saccular aneurysms, but nonetheless, um, the long-term follow-up was deemed similar, although I have this table exerted. The poster circulation aneurysm still generally fared better um, with endovascular therapy, although the, the study is not powered enough to, to have statistical significance. I, I want to emphasize that very important point is that just because a p-value is greater than 0.05 doesn't mean there's no statistical significance. If a p-value is less than 0.05, even in a small study, that's a meaningful finding. That's real. But if a p-value is greater than 0.05, especially if the study is small, that doesn't mean there's no difference. I can't tell you how many papers I review where they look at 50 patients and they say, oh, there's no difference between these two modalities, but the study just isn't powered to detect a difference. Um, but, but anyhow, um, I also think it's sort of a, a moot point 
you know, whether microsurgery or endovascular is better. I would say that if they're equivalent and one approach doesn't require a craniotomy, it's probably more reasonable to do the approach that doesn't require the craniotomy. You know, if I'm going to go through a craniotomy, I'd want the approach to be statistically significantly superior uh, than, than necessarily equipoise, but that's a whole different debate. So again, uh, treatment options, microsurgery, endovascular. We'll talk a little bit about microsurgery as most of my current practice does not at all involve microsurgery, although I, I certainly strongly feel that it is a strong role in the treatment of aneurysms. Uh, still. Uh, so good clip candidates. So in general, unruptured aneurysms are much more favorable to treat microsurgically than ruptured aneurysms. Operating in a, in a, in a heavy subarachnoid hemorrhage fissure is not fun. It's more challenging, uh, certainly in the ACOM region, if you're trying to be honest and, and, and adjudicate whether you have issues with perforators after operating in a ruptured brain. It's a lot harder to preserve them, in my opinion. Um, but uh, again, uh, unruptured aneurysms, uh, are also aneurysms where you really want to benefit, you know. So if you partially coil a ruptured aneurysm and get it secured, get the patient through the subarachnoid hemorrhage window for a more definitive treatment down the road through flow diversion or clipping, that's probably very reasonable. But if you're taking an elective patient with an unruptured aneurysm and you don't get a complete or a, a, a reasonable result, what, what are you really accomplishing? So, you know, durable treatment is really more meaningful in the unruptured setting. And also, again, surgery is a lot easier. Uh, very small ruptured aneurysms can be very hard for endovascular therapy, so some of these certainly still need to be clipped. Very broad neck ruptured aneurysms as well. In general, favorable locations are the MCA and the PCOM. Aneurysms with mass effect as well, a PCOM with a third nerve palsy. They can do meta-analysis after meta-analysis, which they've done. It still shows better results for the third nerve if you do surgery. Um, if you're concerned about follow-up as well, I, th I think clipping is also a, a reasonable uh, option. Uh, so again, clipping involves a craniotomy. This just shows what would be considered a traditional uh, incision for a craniotomy. In this case, there was an or orbitotomy performed as well for this aneurysm. And you can see that the, the surgery is done under the microscope. Uh, after the craniotomy, you split the sylvian fissure, which essentially refers to dividing the arachnoid that is tethering the opercular branches to either the frontal or the temporal lobe to create a safe plane to go down to the insula and then work your way down to the MCA. Uh, and then you, you put a clip on, again, it's, it's much more complicated than easy, but um, the experts make it look easy. But again, st still an excellent modality that's needed for a, still a, a reasonable proportion of aneurysms for sure. Um, so endovascular options, they're a lot more broad than just, quote, coiling. Um, so you have intrasacular options where you go into the aneurysm uh, to deposit coils. Uh, you may need a balloon to facilitate that or a stent or even just pop a web in. So to the far right, you can see there's a posteriorly projecting uh, terminus aneurysm that's treated through web embolization. That's just a single device that you put in and deploy. Um, and then we'll also talk about flow diversion where you put a stent on the outside of the aneurysm and the aneurysm gradually thromboses and occludes, probably one of the most powerful and effective ways to treat an aneurysm if it's appropriate for flow diversion. Uh, so here are some examples of simple coiling. To the left, this is a basilar apex aneurysm that was ruptured that was treated with coiling. This was a ruptured superior cerebellar artery aneurysm where we put a little coil in the daughter lobe at the top uh, and then coil off the rest. Uh, and here's even, this is actually when I mentioned malignant pericolosal. So this was a patient who came in with a grade two subarachnoid hemorrhage all high up with this tiny pericolosal aneurysm that we just put one little coil in to secure. She was an elderly patient. Um, and this just shows how malignant they are. And again, you could treat with simple coiling. Um, what's nice is these small aneurysms tend to have smaller necks and are easier to deal with. Um, uh, because if the neck is small, the neck is small, and small aneurysm, by definition, the diameter of the neck can't be too large. Um, this is an example of a very broad neck pica aneurysm in an elderly patient that was treated with balloon coiling. You can see how broad the neck is there, and we used a balloon. Um, and here's, here's actually that ICA terminus aneurysm that was treated with balloon coiling. Um, and so here's a nice illustration of stent coiling. This is a, an ophthalmic aneurysm. I did not elect to flow divert this because the artery had a tremendous amount of calcification in it. Uh, so you can see I start on the bottom left with a framing coil, but then you can see I put a second coil, there's significant coil herniation. And then as we move to the right, you can see how nice it looks or better it looks after I put a stent and then we completed the coiling. This is an example of a Y stent coiling for a basilar apex aneurysm. You can see there's actually two stents. You can see each one limb of each stent into the PCA that then terminates into the basilar, and then you subsequently coil the aneurysm. Um, this is something I don't do too much 
nowadays of this is a transcirculation stent where you put a stent from the PCA to the PCA by going through the PCOM. I don't do this much anymore because I'll use web for a lot of these. So what's happening on the far left is there's a stent that's deployed spanning the right PCA to the left PCA. There's a catheter that's traversing the left PCOM that deployed the stent. And there's a jailed catheter in the aneurysm to deploy coils. And you can see that we then coil the aneurysm to the result on the far right. Uh, again, most of these nowadays are treated with a web. So this is a large basilar aneurysm where we just deploy a web device to manage it. Um, Here's another one uh, where there's actually incorporation of the left PCA into the aneurysm where we just make sure we shelf a web up high enough to preserve flow into the left PCA. Uh, and here's, here's a case of a, of a basilar apex aneurysm. Uh, the, the reason I'm showing the CTA is the patient has very bad plaque. So this was done radially. Um, I, I certainly believe I, I do a lot of interventions radially. I think it's a phenomenal modality. I don't think it's quite worthy of being put on Twitter every time I do it, um, but uh, this is a case uh, of a basilar apex aneurysm uh, that we treated through a radial approach. And what's nice is you can sometimes mold the web. So in this case, I sort of molded the web uh, to the shape of the aneurysm. You can see the fall resulted of one and a half years. Um, this was a ruptured pica uh, with a very broad neck. These can be very difficult to manage uh, when they have a broad neck, certainly in the ruptured setting, and no one's excited about doing surgery. So this is very much off-label, but I used a web in this ruptured setting, and, and you can see the long-term follow-up result. Um, I do think that web is still an intrasacular approach, and it does have the limitation of coils intrasacularly. I do see recanalization uh, with web. It's, it's certainly not as uh, durable as, as clipping, but it does have its place as a relatively facile intrasacular therapy in well-selected patients. So flow diversion, probably our strongest endovascular approach. And this is really the last thing I'll be talking about. Um, you can see uh, to the left, this is a, just a typical ophthalmic aneurysm treated with a flow diverting pipeline stent. Uh, the stent is shown here on the left. Um, this is a, a larger uh, bilobe basilar aneurysm that was treated with flow diversion and coiling to occlusion. And you can see this very irregular sort of moth-eaten communicating segment aneurysm treated with flow diversion as well. Um, the results are are often very satisfying in well-selected patients. Here's a, a, a distal ACA aneurysm. It's not really associated with the close of marginal artery that was treated with flow diversion. And what you could see is that uh, another effect of putting a stent in these beyond just diverting flow from the aneurysm is the flow diverter sort of relaxes the angle of the artery. Remember, these are hemodynamic. These aneurysms form due to curves or turns in the artery. So when you put a stent in and it relaxes that curve, that also has a bit of a therapeutic effect as well. And, and this was a good illustration of it. This is a cavernous aneurysm in a patient with a six nerve palsy that was treated with flow diversion. And uh, this is sort of an off-label application. This is a very elderly patient with a ruptured anterior communicating artery aneurysm, uh, really tiny, too small for me at least to, to, to manage with a coil. So I used a flow diverter that had good effect. Um, and these are just some final cases where a mix of, 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 of coiling uh, and flow diversion. This is a partially thrombosed basilar aneurysm that I felt needed to be coiled as well, but I couldn't fit two catheters in through the posterior circulation. So I had to come transcirculation to put the coil catheter in and then put a flow diverter and then coil the aneurysm. Uh, this is another, this is a vertebral basilar junction aneurysm, a significant mass effect on the pons that was treated by a combination of flow diversion and coiling. Again, a flow diversion is really a powerful bullet that we have. Uh, in endovascular therapy. This was that SCA case I showed early on. This patient actually presented not only with a third nerve palsy, but with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, there was a pseudoaneurysm uh, associated with the aneurysm. So I put some coils in the pseudoaneurysm and then loosely packed the aneurysm. You can see the supracerebellar artery comes out of the aneurysm, so I don't want to close it off completely. So I used a combination of the coils and I put a pipeline flow diverter in here. And you can see this is a one-year follow-up. There's still some filling at the base of the aneurysm to preserve flow in the SCA, but for me, this is the best result I can, I can get with this aneurysm. Um, this is just a brief summary of, of the aneurysm locations, uh, natural history, the pluses refer to sort of the, the risk of rupture, in my humble opinion, uh, where to look for them on a CTA uh, when you're trying to identify them radiographically, uh, and generally sort of a preferred treatment. Dealers means clip or coil. Uh, I guess when I put this one together, I still said clip for MCA bifurcations, uh, but uh, you know it sort of depends if it's coilable or not. Um, but this is just a, a brief uh, opinionated reference of my own. Um, so uh, in summary, we've talked about the natural history of cerebral aneurysms. 
We've talked about treatment, certainly of any rupture or symptomatic aneurysms, and then factoring in the age, increasing size, location of the aneurysm, and morphology into whether or not you treat or not treat. Uh, and then options, uh, microsurgery, uh, which again is touted for its durability and potential, manage, potential to manage incorporated daughter, daughter, daughter vessels, and then endovascular therapy, um, which we've talked about the variety of options in, in brief strokes, um, which is generally touted for its safety. Um, again, I don't, I don't really like the term less invasive. I, I've, done, I've done a lot of endovascular treatments in a variety of ways, and certainly, humbly, I've shown great cases, and uh, that's, that's why I want everyone to want to do vascular when they look at this study, but um, you know, we certainly have our complications and our challenges with everything we do. It keeps us humble and keeps us uh, yearning to do this better and safer every day. Um, with that, I, I really appreciate your attention, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.